Hello, everyone. Uh, it's 10, 10 a.m. sharp here in Central Europe, although I'm not in Central Europe. Um, you're very welcome to the first webinar of the webinar series, Residences in Challenging Time. Um, my name is Luigi Galimberti. I'm a board member of Resartis, uh, which is the largest network of arts residences in the world. Um, and I also work for University of the Arts London. I was previously at Tate, and before that, I directed uh, an exchange and residency program for artists, architects, designers, and writers across Brazil, China, and several European countries called Transnational Dialogues. I also founded uh, ArteP, which is a project in support of the creative industries in, in Paraguay. And I'm here with you today. I'm here with um, Johan Pusset. Johan is director of the YASPIS program at the Swedish Arts Grants Committee. He was previously founding director of the Baltic Art Center, an expert advisor to the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, and also a board member of Artists, an advisory board member of Transcultural Exchange. Uh, Johan is also um, a curator, a freelance curator, and a writer. This is our first webinar. Uh, I will briefly um, show you the, um, the agenda of the day. Um, I, I think that what, what, what we are talking about today, uh, I think the, the main topic is how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted uh, on the residency sector and on, on the arts and cultural sector more in general. Uh, and particularly, we are trying to kind of shed light on the context in which art organizations are currently operating uh, and what the responses from the sectors uh, have been so far and particularly what's coming next. We will uh, start with um, an introduction of Yaspis and Resartis to give you also a bit of context about uh, why we are here with you today and, and why we decided to, um, to start this series. Then we, uh, I will present um, the whole series of, of webinars. Uh, and then I will go more into the depth of the topic of today's topic, which is the arrival and impact of the, of the pandemic on the residency sector. I will also present some preliminary findings for, from a survey that Resart is, is, uh, has been running with UCL London. Um, and then we will open up the floor. I, I now um, I now let uh, Johan uh, introduce uh, Jaspis. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, series of webinars and also for residence practice. Um, I'll give a short introduction of of Jaspis. Um, Jaspis is the international exchange and studio program in Sweden. It's it's a part of the Arts Grants Committee which is the governmental agency that distributes basically all uh, uh, public funding uh, for individual artists of all kinds. Uh, the Justice program is the international program and it's open for all kinds of visual artists and designers, architects and craft artists. So it's quite a wide scoop. Um, we have uh, 12 studios in three different cities, uh, in, in four different cities in, in Sweden, and in Stockholm is the largest part of the program. Um, the residence studio program is, of course, uh, a very dominant part of what EASPIS is, is doing. Um, it's about to give time. Uh, two artists to enter into open-ended processes and to dive into concentrated work, basically. Uh, it is a quite a closed practice. Uh, it should be also, but we do open up twice a year for, for open studios to encourage meetings between the international and Swedish artists and, and other professionals in, in the field. Um, we also have an extensive program for visiting curators uh, to, to facilitate meetings between the international art scene and the Sweden-based art scene. 
we we tend to to look upon artists not as nationalities but where they are based so any artist based in sweden and with the main part of their practice can can apply to Jaspis and the Swedish Art Grants Committee for, for support. Um, we also do uh, public programs. Uh, these can be uh, lectures, of course. I think this is a very important part of what we do. We try to support an ongoing conversation about the arts, uh, the socio-political aspects, and how different international influences can also support development of the Swedish art scene. The, the public program can be quite theoretical, uh, but it can also be more uh, more vivid. Uh, I also want to mention a, a project that we did last year about collective practices. So after a survey that we did with the Museum of Modern Art in, in Sweden, we noticed that many artists work more and more with collective practices. And that led us into a huge project that ended with a free day forum in Stockholm, where we invited 80 artists from all over the world uh, to spend time and to share experiences and to do uh, different workshops together for, for free days which was a huge uh, success and something very different for a governmental agency to, to dive into. And this will actually be a book that also will be launched in, in December this year. Um, the slide we see now is from another survey that I also want to mention, because in our agency, we also have a department for, for Analyze that monitor the living and working conditions for professional artists. And one survey that we did quite recently was to ask uh, professional artists in Sweden about their ideas and thoughts and wishes when it comes to residence practice. Uh, so the slide you see right now is, is for the question, uh, are you interested in residence and actually yourself going to a residence, which was a huge majority saying yes <laughs> and in the survey we also we also made different uh, selections so you could also tell about um, the different um, answers from depending on, on the sex uh, or, or different art forms. Um, so something that came out from this survey uh, was that many artists want to go for shorter residence periods and they would like to go nearby of because of climate reasons so residence is available uh, via train for example was something very much uh, asked for another aspect was that you really want to go with your partner and family or with your colleagues because many artists and more and more ask uh, for a possibility to work as a collective and to work together. Um, we also support, and that's a large part of our activity, is that we give grants for international exchange. So basically many of the artists in Sweden that are invited to important exhibitions abroad uh, get a support from JASPIS and the Arts Grants Committee. Uh, this slide is, is from Performa in New York, uh, where we had a large Swedish uh, participation in November this year. Um, this artist is Eva Mag, who did a performance in, in the Jansson uh, gym. Um, International collaborations, like the collaboration with Performa, is of course a super important part of our activities. Um, basically, it's so much about meetings between people. So we, we facilitate meetings between artists and artists and artists and curators and artists and institutions. And this has all changed, of course, now with, with the pandemic. 
So as for many residence uh, centers or international um, practices, the corona pandemic has changed everything. What we have done, which I will mention just briefly, what we have done at the Jaspis when it comes to the residency practice is that the international artists who should have been at the Jaspis right now, they are now invited as online artists in residence. So they are, so to say, in residence at the Jaspis at home. Uh, so now we have four artists. We have Una Nelson in San Francisco. We have Dan Halter in Cape Town in South Africa. We have Joao Valig in uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. And we have Alexis Destop in Sydney in Australia with us, but not physically with us, but they are with us online. This is all new for us. So we are learning a lot. Thanks to the corona, we are learning a lot. And uh, of course, we lose something. Now, we hope for all these artists to come to Sweden in next year. So this will be like a startup. Uh, and we lose the physical presence. And we, we, we do not have the possibility of, of in real life encounters. But we gain something else. Something we have discovered is also the benefit of having artists online. So we can actually <clears throat> walk around together with the Swedish artists. We can walk around in Dan Halter's studio in Cape Town, have a look out on the streets and realize it's winter in Cape Town. And we can look at Dan's ongoing artistic work and actually meet also with his assistant. So this we would not have in a normal residency. So something something new happens with the crisis. And I'm sure this is something that we will bring with us for the future when it comes to residency practice. The last slide is just showing um, the ad advertisement for the Jaspis Open Studios that happens twice a year. And this year in September, it will happen totally online, which is also the first time uh, for us to, to try out something new. So it will go on not for one day, but for almost one week. And we have constructed uh, an, an online uh, digital platform for, for the open studios. And this can be as, uh, accessed through the Justice website. I think that I will end there, Luigi. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Johan, for your for your presentation, I think you've touched upon quite a few themes that we will be addressing in our webinar series, particularly environmental concerns and the issues linked with the uh, digitalization of, of exchanges, uh, which which are definitely they're, they're both opportunities at the same time they're both challenges for for many organizations and many artists as well. Um, now it's my turn to uh, briefly introduce REST Artists. We, we have quite a large contingent of members. We have uh, more than 550 members uh, all over the world. Uh, they are residencies, uh, they are individuals, and we also have associate uh, members. We, um, we consider ourselves the, the worldwide professional body for the field in a way that we, we, we put a lot of effort in the professional development of uh, residency managers, residency operators, and we are advocate uh, for the sector um, across all levels, uh, from the local level to national and supranational level. And also we contribute to, um, to international cultural mobility policy as well. Um, and we have been here for almost 30 years now, and I, I hope that our contribution to the sector um, has been making a difference and I'm sure it will make a difference even more with artists together with, with other organizations we collaborate with uh, to, to, to make sure that our sector is as sustainable as possible uh, in all senses of the world. Uh, I'm talking about an environmental sense, but also about a social and, and economical sense for everyone, for both uh, residencies and, and artists and all cultural practitioners that um, are part of this ecosystem. I will briefly show you 
one of our uh, main features, which is public. It's accessible by everyone. It's, it's in, on our website. We have a directory of all of our residences. Um, you can kind of explore the, the world from, from our website or part of the, parts of the world from our website. Um, you can filter residences by geographical area, type, duration. I think it's also a very interesting tool for research purposes and to understand how this sector is developing. Um, there, is a, um, there is a map uh, that you can, you can browse residencies, you can select a residency that might interest you, uh, and then you can uh, explore uh, and learn more about this residency and get in touch with them as well uh, if, you're, if you're interested. Uh, and you're all very welcome to, to use this resource. It's made freely accessible to everyone. Uh, and then I think it's, a, uh, it's also, it gives also um, um, a comprehensive picture of the breadth and depth of the sector. It really shows uh, the difference that our residencies are making all over the world. Um, from small rural communities to, um, to, to large metropolis and megalopolis, uh, there are residences all over and they all play um, a very vital role in our communities and not just the artistic communities. And for this reason, uh, and particularly uh, against, uh, on, on the background of the, of the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, yes, we we have decided to offer a series of webinars, of so five webinars, uh, that will take place uh, in the next month, month and a half. Um, we we believe uh, and we see that it is a challenging moment. It is a challenging moment for for everyone, for practitioners, for organizations, uh, and and I think that we we hope that we are able to offer uh, tools, resources. Uh, and, and we will share ideas that hopefully will contribute and will help uh, your professional practice. Um, I, I, I hope that we, have, we will cover uh, kind of the main, uh, the, the main uh, let's say, issues at stake. Uh, something to note is that many things that we will talk about were there before COVID. And COVID has exacerbated certain uh, issues. Uh, as uh, accelerated certain developments. Uh, and again, COVID as a, a, as a threat to our existence in a way as a cultural sector, but also COVID as an opportunity to reform ourselves, to make us more, uh, more sustainable, more resilient. Uh, all the webinars uh, are freely accessible. Uh, you can subscribe on, 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 on if you go to Res Artis and Yaspi's website, you can use Eventbrite, subscribe yourself, uh, and, and if you miss the webinar, don't worry, we will uh, put them online, freely available, a couple of weeks after uh, each webinar. And again, if you have questions, do get in touch with us, you're very welcome, and we, we love to, to hear from you. So our next webinar uh, will be uh, about um, alternative residency models, uh, which partly are um, stem from, our con from the current contingency. So COVID has pushed us all to go digital. So uh, Jean-Baptiste Jolie and, and, and Iris Ferrer, they will discuss uh, the opportunities and challenges of, of going digital, um, particularly drawing from their own experience as Jean Bautista, uh, former uh, founding director of Academie Schloss Solitude, and here, here is as a cultural practitioner uh, and collaborator of Green Papaya, Manila, the Philippines. Um, and, 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 I think, and I think this is a, a, a very good starting point also because we will talk about hospitality and the, the, the notion of hospitality, the value of hospitality, how can we be hospitable uh, without uh, physical encounters? Uh, and, and also, how can we make physical encounters possible despite the restrictions uh, that COVID uh, has brought to us and unfortunately it seems it will bring to us at least for, for many months. The, um, the following talk uh, is, about, um, is about how to make residences organizations more, more resilient, uh, uh, particularly from a, a legal standpoint. 
uh, Sarah Farley of Trust Law will present a, a legal checklist that they have developed for nonprofits in general, and, and particularly they have also uh, released a new version uh, of for nonprofits under COVID, um, and, and this will uh, cover uh, issues such as uh, con uh, also cover issues such as contracts um, and, and, such, and, and all those uh, legal aspects that um, residents and resident managers need to take care of in order for the artists to have a better experience or for themselves uh, also to, to have a, a smoother uh, and, and safer experience uh, during COVID and after COVID as well. And Sarah will be joined by Res Artist President uh, Leo Laughlin. The, the fourth webinar, uh, which is in October, um, it it is about one of probably the most important issue that our societies are, are currently facing at the moment, which is a, an issue of social injustice, uh, which is an issue that, that, that see um, part of the world population, uh, which is actively discriminated against at all levels, uh, from, the, from the nation states to the communities. Uh, and, and this also happens in the cultural sector. So um, we thought that it is uh, vital, essential that we discuss this um, and, and we make clear where we stand and also where we want to go. And um, Yinka uh, Shunibare and Lisa von der Burke Hoffman, they will also provide us with, with tools and ideas and discussions of where we should go and how, how, how we should get there. And um, I think this is, and again, this is something that uh, unfortunately has been a feature of our society, particularly Western societies for centuries, uh, but uh, the COVID situation uh, has uh, again exacerbated uh, this issue as much as it has exacerbated the issue of uh, climate change. Uh, uh, and, and particularly now the risk that all the advancement that we, that we have made as a society in terms of environment um, would be somehow lost because of COVID, um, and particularly because COVID is now making the headlines and climate change is not so much uh, uh, anymore. Um, and at, at the same time, also we will discuss uh, how, 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 how to make residency sustainable in a way, how to be sustainable, and also we will, we will say why, why residences are important, despite their carbon footprint, uh, despite, of course, not traveling is, 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 looks like it is more sustainable than, than traveling. Uh, but uh, at the same time, as cultural practitioner, we, we, we would like to, again, um, support the idea that uh, exchanging a residence is, 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 is part of what we do as professionals, but also it's essential for our democracies. Um, and, and I hope that uh, this, this series of webinars um, will create a sense of community uh, within our sectors uh, and will reinforce uh, the collaborations between artists and practitioners and institutions uh, all over the world. And now this is my, this is my starting point um, of my presentation. I'll try to be uh, as uh, short as possible. What you see is, um, is a banner, which is, is, is an official banner by Italian Minister of Culture, uh, published in, at the beginning of March. Just, just in case you didn't understand what was happening, closed all over Italy, cinemas, theaters, museums, archeological sites, archives, and libraries. So that's, the, 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 this has been the, the, the impact of COVID on our sector. At the same time, I, I would like to mention that when we talk about COVID, uh, we should not forget that we are talking about um, 850,000 deaths uh, as of this morning. <clears throat> and the impact uh, that these deaths uh, had on our communities is massive. So let's not forget the, the human aspect of COVID. Uh, we will also unfortunately see a lot of the um, economical aspect of COVID. Um, COVID COVID-19 uh, will bring a, a, a substantial recession uh, in, in our economies. All major economies um, will have a negative growth. 
uh, only India and China will have a slightly positive growth, but less than 3%, which is probably not, 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 not sustainable for, for, for the one projection. So this, this, is, this is one of the world's major sanitary and social crises since World War II. Um, and this is the context. And, and we as cultural practitioners, we, we have to deal with this context in many ways. We have to respond, we have to be uh, empathic also to, towards what's happening around us and certainly not to forget the social uh, and human dimension. The, these are, I believe, are the areas that have been most impacted by COVID-19. Um, and and it's, it's about everything that, that we do as, as artists and practitioners. It's about artists not being able to access studios for a long time, so not being able to, to produce. It's about venues being shut, which means no performances, no exhibition. It's about museums uh, being not being accessible uh, still today, many of them, uh, and, and, and depriving the public of the, of the enjoyment uh, of, of the arts. And it's also about residences not being able to operate and exchanges um, having to, to slow down or becoming uh, exclusively virtual. But, but again, it's about uh, many, many practitioners that are, are freelancers uh, and, and also um, rely on, on, on other jobs uh, be besides their own uh, artistic practice uh, and, and seeing the kind of the lifeline being threatened by, by unemployment and by societies uh, kind of slowing down uh, massively. And again, it's about the, the well-being of, of, of everyone else. So this is the, this is the, the view and, and, and again, when we, when we discuss COVID-19, I think this is, um, these are all elements that are worth taking into consideration. If you wanted to hear how the situation will look like for me, unfortunately, I'm not being able to tell you. It's too early to quantify, it's way too early. We will know in 2021, maybe late, late 2020, but it's definitely too early to understand and to assess the full impact. We still don't know when the pandemic will be over. And we have to understand that uh, our sector is interlinked to so many other sectors uh, and, and all societies uh, have been affected. So it, it's quite um, difficult to uh, have, a, have, a, have a precise idea of what, what's going to happen. But efforts uh, in that sense can be made and um, ourselves as research artists together with uh, UCL University College London, we run a survey uh, in May, spring. We'll run a second survey in October and a third one next year. We had over a thousand responses, which is a, a massive, 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 a uh, very positive uh, feedback from the sector uh, that they want to express their opinion. 70% artists, 30% organizations. I'm going to present you some preliminary findings, so take them as, as they are, that they, they might slightly change in the final version. But I wanted to share this with you uh, to give you a kind of a more uh, holistic view uh, of the sector. But why residences? Why residences are important and why residences are, are crucial to understand the sector? Because we are, we are a place of exchange, we are a place of production, of research and exhibition, we are interdisciplinary and we are multicultural. Um, and this is what, what makes us a, a very interesting case study uh, for the cultural sector. This is the, this is the, the impact and this is the, the these are the responses uh, from our survey. So in terms of organization, only five, this is May, May, June 2020, May, June this year, only 5% of the organizations continue their program as usual. 50% postpone activities, the, the, the remaining percentage they simply cancel uh, activities. Uh, and uh, as of June, 9% uh, of residences that we interviewed uh, were planning to close their residences. And, and I expect this number to grow. Um, and only 20% of them were able to access emergency funding, uh, which is very good for those who did, but, uh, but certainly not for those who, who didn't. Uh, and, and again, also because some of the residences are not legally registered, or even if they are, uh, uh, they were in countries where no, no help 
uh, was was available for such ventures. In terms of artists, that's the the impact has been felt uh, on many respects. Um, this is the impact uh, that cancellation of residency uh, has brought, and 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 the, the numbers of the figures that I'm going to show you, and as you can find in the slide, they are they are about a critical or significant impact, um, and this is true for professional development, of course, for community engagement, uh, for networking. Uh, but at the same time, it's also true for the creation of new works, which also has an impact on, on the finances of artists. And not to be neglected is that one in four respondents said that the cancellation of residences had a critical or significant impact on their mental health and, and on their well-being. So again, this is something that uh, we should be aware of uh, when, when now, particularly, and also when things will restart, is that um, the experience of COVID-19 has been a very problematic experience uh, for, 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 many, for many of us. Again, from the survey, there have been also some positive responses uh, uh, in a way that residences have reacted, they went digital, they strengthened their online portfolios, uh, and they uh, they tried to make as many uh, activities online as possible. They also reviewed how their contracts and 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 how they and their insurances, which is something which is very cru crucial. And we, we we always invite our members to to be more as structured as possible in order to protect themselves and uh, the visiting artists. Uh, in any case, but particularly in such uh, circumstances. This is my last slide before our conversation. I think now part of the world seems to be kind of slowly opening up. And there is a talk of going back to normal, but I think we should question what we mean by, by normal. What is the new normal? What do we want? Are we sure that are, are we sure that we want to go back to to what we used to call normal? Because if I um, if I if I remember correctly, before March, our normal was a normal of uh, widening inequalities, was a, a normality made of weakening of cultural and social fabrics, was a normality of uh, increased mass surveillance and was a normality of institutional racism. So when we, when, we, when we talk about going back to normal, resuming our normal life, I think it is imperative that we question what we want and make clear that what was normal before was not sustainable, was not sustainable socially, was not sustainable environmentally. Our societies have the resources, uh, intellectual, uh, financial, and otherwise to, to be better societies. Uh, and and we, we, I think we have really to, um, to work towards this. Um, and, and, and I hope um, we can all contribute as a, as a cultural sector to, um, to the improvement of, of our societies um, for, for everyone else. And I, I stopped here my presentation. I, I went a bit long, uh, but I will make sure that we will have enough time um, for our conversation. Uh, I will start the conversation with Johan, uh, and then uh, Eliza, our director, is kind of moderating questions from the audience. You're very welcome. Please do ask your questions, uh, and, and, and we will uh, we'll, uh, make sure that we answer them as many as possible uh, uh, until, until, until there, is, there is time for it. Thank you, Luigi. So, very interesting and, and many uh, difficult and important issues that, that you brought up. Uh, I just wanted to say that, that what you ended with, uh, Luigi, I think this is, this is super interesting. And to ask the questions about the, the post-COVID situation and the role of the arts and the role of the arts residences is is a very interesting and important topic. Uh, personally, I, I'm very much involved in the arts because I, I strongly believe that what 
what the contemporary art can do is to provide alternative perspectives to how we, we normally uh, perceive the world and our environment. And, and this will be so important right now and for the future. And, and <clears throat> I think within Resartis and within the world of residences, it's, it's also interesting to talk about the role of the residency practice. And, and I don't have the answers, but I, I could certainly think about some questions because we have always been talking about residency practice as, as some, something which provides time, basically. <clears throat> and now with the pandemic, I think many artists and many people have experienced that they suddenly have more time uh, being self-isolated. So time suddenly became something that we have more of. Uh, and encounters, physical encounters, is something that we have less. And, and talking about residences, these are the two major, maybe the two major benefits, both facilitating encounters uh, and also providing time for, for um, rethinking uh, and entering into, into um, open-ended artistic processes. So, so how does the role of the residencies change in a, in a post-pandemic world? And, and what kind of role in what we call the artistic ecosystem or the cultural ecosystem do, do we have as residency providers? And what kind of role will we have? And what kind of role should we have maybe uh, looking, looking for the future? Uh, that's a that's a very interesting point, Johan. I think it's very very hard to give um, just one answer in a way, uh, because uh, we see ourselves as res artists. There is a lot of diversity within our members, mm -hmm. uh, diversity in terms of objectives, in terms of what they want to reach with their own residences, what they want, what what they offer, how they position themselves. So I I, I don't see. Uh, I, I don't see kind of this sector as a whole uh, moving towards one specific direction. Uh, I think there will be many responses, different responses. Uh, some residences will likely not change, uh, maybe for good reasons, may, maybe not. Uh, many residences will instead decide that to make one of the kind of the key issues that we've been talking about uh, an essential part of the programming. I, I, I think we will we will see. Uh, I think what we what we can what we can do. Um, I think is we should question ourselves more, uh, and then we should we should listen to, and we should have other questioning ourselves more, uh, and and we should be more open to feedback, and and more open to to change because there are there are some issues that. We, we, we luckily not go away. So the fact that there, there are people saying, oh, well, why, why do you travel? Why do you keep traveling? Why do, why do you push people traveling, um, taking flights? There is a carbon footprint, etc." cetera. It's, it's a very good question. The question should be there. And, and every time we plan an activity that requires travel, we really need to understand, is this, a, is this a essential? Can, that, can this be done in, in another way? Uh, should we draw more uh, locally, but at the same time we should be careful not to not to kind of isolate themselves from the rest of the world and not to close borders, because unfortunately what I've seen is that we are at a very complicated uh, moment in a way. It's a very difficult conjuncture because as as practitioners that that travel and, and believe in physical exchange, because on the one side there is the issues of of, of carbon footprint. On the other side, uh, there are the restrictions imposed by COVID. And at the same time, there are a, a resurgence of nationalism, which is making travel more and more difficult uh, because of visa restrictions, etc. cetera. Um, so I think we must, be, we must be very careful and understand because also traveling is a reaction to uh, nation state closing borders and decided that 
uh, if you're not a, a part of that world, you, you cannot go there anymore. Uh, I, I, I think I think this is uh, this is something that needs to be needs to be um, questioned at the very least. Yes, absolutely. And maybe if I can just very briefly chime in. Um, hi, everyone. I, I'm Eliza. I'm the executive director of Res Artists. Um, thank you so much, Luigi and Johan, for a wonderful discussion so far. And I look forward to opening it up uh, to the audience shortly, who I know are waiting with some questions. Um, I think at the very start of organising this this webinar series with IASPIS, um, we we had a discussion about this aspect of time and you know space and time in relation to, I guess what was now you know the classical model of a residency. Um, and I sort of joked that COVID nineteen is actually like one giant very long residency for everyone. It's giving everyone you know a lot of time for um reflection on practice and, and and ways of doing things and what our future holds um and as luigi said you know what is going to be our new normal um i think it was only about must be a year and a half ago now we were in kyoto and um, sitting in the kyoto art center uh for our res artist conference and we were looking at the way residency models have been shaped historically by external factors. So things like humanitarian crises, um, climate change, technology, um, AI. And of course, then COVID-19 hit um, a global pandemic. And I see this as, um, you know, the same situation, really. I think it will absolutely, undoubtedly uh, shape residency models in the future. And of course, we are already seeing that through um, digital formats, um, also home residencies, as, you, as you've mentioned, studio residencies. And I do agree with Luigi, um, there is not going to be a, a one size fits all model. Um, and I think that's a good thing. You know, the amazing thing about our sector is it is so incredibly diverse in scale model. Um, context and location and I think um, in a way we have to we, we have to see every challenge as an opportunity um, and really look to rebuild and reshape the field moving moving forward um, Luigi in particular has mentioned the survey that Res Artis has done and uh, some of the results from the first iteration of that survey there's there's going to be two more surveys that follow so we're hoping um to uh, to release the the analysis report of the first survey by the end of september and that will go out to all of our members and the public as well um and to to demonstrate that raw data but also to give some um some context and, and theory behind that but also uh in october we're looking to produce a second survey that looks at the medium term impact. And then of course, we'll follow up with a third and final survey that looks at long term. So we look forward to sharing those results um, and that sort of hard data with the audience as well. There is a, there is a very uh, good question from, from the audience. Uh, and I am going to ask this question to you, Eliza and Johan then. Uh, which is what, what, in your opinion, are essential components of a home residency? Not, well, well, not um, answer. I think I, I'm sure a home residency could be, <clears throat> could be done in many different ways. Um, one organization that we have been in contact with is the, the Kone Foundation in, in Finland, who have practiced, <clears throat> I would say, uh, support to uh, artists um, as home residences, so giving them a grant and possibility to work from home during the crisis. But from from our conversations with with Kony Foundation, I, I I remember that one very important aspect. I mean, besides the possibility to keep up your artistic work is how to meet the other, the other artists 
in home residencies. And that, that brings me to, to something very important when it comes to, to the, new, <coughs> the new normal, as you said, uh, Luigi. Um, so the, the encounter between people is, is probably um, maybe the most important uh, what is coming up now. And this encounter must happen also in real life. But we can also provide new possibilities for, for uh, virtual encounters. And I think this is something that we have discovered thanks to the pandemic and that we will, we will be able to use. So maybe an act of balance between the physical encounters and the virtual encounters. And Johanna found something really interesting when you were talking about your online residency that you offer, um, which was around that idea of through technology, the artists are obviously getting glimpses and aspects of Sweden, such as the studios, but various surrounds. But with technology, you're also able to access their local environment. Mm. And um, it, it sort of, I hadn't really thought about that in much detail before. Um, I mean, do you, are you finding this in a, in a strange way, even though it's not an in-person exchange, is it more of a, a mutually beneficial and sort of reciprocal, truly reciprocal model that you're working with? Well, I think we, we are like learning uh, day by day right now, since we, we were never tried this before. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Now we are having our first uh, three month online residency period. It will be August, September and October. And then of course we will evaluate um, and there might very well be one more coming up. Um, but what we realize is the possibility to, to work with the digital channels um, like, like openings, to have like an open window to other artists' studios. Um, and also to work with the digital channels as, as like a constantly open door. We, want, we, we now uh, are putting in, in function and, an open door to the Aspis residency kitchen because this is where actually all the artists meet when they are there physically in Stockholm. So we invite the artists who are now in four very different parts of the world um, on four different continents to also meet in the Aspis kitchen, but then online. So for, for me, may, I might belong to an older generation, but I think it's also like a structural or a mindset shift to look upon the digital channels as, as an open door and not like a phone call, because a phone call is something that you start and you end, but a digital channel can actually be an open door which is constantly open and you can, you can access, you can revisit, you can visit and revisit whenever you like. So, so Ona who is in San Francisco can just pop in to see if someone is in the in the kitchen, both in the virtual sense and the physical sense, uh, and there they will be spontaneous meetings. But you can also, through your own channel, you can bring your artists' friends or curators into your studio for, for a walk or for a tour or for a conversation. So that's, I think it's also about how we use the digital channels, how we look upon them. Uh, another question from from the audience, which I which uh, relates uh, very closely to this, and I, is about virtual programs. Uh, and the question is: Do you see virtual programs as a temporary solution, or as something that can can remain an important part of the residency field after the pandemic? I, I, I'm gonna try to give a um, uh, kind of quick answer to this myself. Virtual programs were there before and will be there after the pandemic. There will be more and more online activity. But uh, to me, they are not a substitute of a physical exchange program. They are either an extension or of a physical exchange program, so a tool in addition 
to the tools that um, are already there for those in residency, or they are a different thing in a way. So um, we, we should be careful not to trade the physicality of exchanges with um, virtual exchanges. They are, they are two different things, uh, both extremely, uh, potentially extremely uh, fruitful, uh, but, but they, have, they, have different, um, they have different rules, they have different rules of play. Uh, they have advantages and disadvantages, which are, which are very different from, from each other. But this is my view, and I know we will <clears throat> discuss actually uh, quite a lot on this um, in the next webinar um, on the on the fourth of September with, <coughs> with Jean Baptiste Jolie and uh, Iris Ferrer. Uh, this will be one of the one of the topics of the day for sure. Yes. I think it's in, sorry. Sorry, you go, Johan. I think it's important point that you have there, Luigi, that it's not about replacing. Um, something uh, physical with something virtual, but to look upon the virtual as an interesting complement to, to, to the physical encounter. Uh, we have done several uh, lectures and conversations online, uh, which works quite well. Um, the, the, the good side is that it becomes accessible for many more people. Otherwise, we would probably have done this lecture in our uh, space in, in Stockholm and reach out to, let's say, maximum 70 persons. And now we can make it accessible for so many more artists and, and professionals. So that's, that's the upside of, of the problem, so to say. Uh, I just want to, wanted to quote um, Jean-Baptiste Choulis, who will be one of the upcoming uh, uh, speakers. Because I, I talked to Jean-Baptiste and he told me about the survey that he did in, in Berlin uh, about the situation of, of residency uh, practice. And, and one quote was from the DJAD residency saying that there is nothing that can replace the in real life uh, encounter. This is the core of the residency practice. But as we have already said, the virtual encounter can be complementary to this. And, and I think it's definitely something that we can explore more. Yes, absolutely. And I, I really just wanted to back up what you're both saying. I think we'd probably all be in the wrong field if we didn't believe that in-person exchange and that sort of people to people engagement is the best thing um, that simply cannot be replaced. Um, it's interesting, every, everything you're both saying, I keep just thinking back to the survey um, that we're analysing at the moment. And it was interesting, we asked that question to both artists and arts residencies. Do you see, um, you know, can residencies take place online? And while everyone agreed there were various aspects of the residency that could take place online, whether it was even the creation of new works or um, alumni engagement, networking, these sorts of things, um, they also answered that no, residencies are all about people to people exchange. So I think those two elements, those two responses tell us that yes, it should be seen as, as sort of complementary to to the the real thing where possible mm. we we should also think about the, the situation for uh, curatorial practice since residences is of course about the encounter between artist and artist but also about the encounter between artist and curator um, that brings for many artists very uh, important working possibilities for the future and in, in new countries probably and what something that we experienced is that the virtual opportunity to meet has not been so interesting for curators. And I think partly this is because it becomes almost like accessing a portfolio on, online, which they can do anyway. Um, so we have tried, we have tried to reach out to, to curators to do online uh, studio visits. 
but the interest has not been so large. And also depending on that the curator situation in the pandemic is now that all the exhibition projects that they would probably be scouting for, they are also on hold. So, so it's, it's kind of a stand, standing still situation and many curators then enter into other projects, maybe writing commissions or other kind of, of commissions that does not really include the studio visits as, as a top priority. And I, I think it's something there in, that we also have to think about the curators and something we try out now at YASP is is that we we would then provide residency opportunities for for curators that I, I know that many residence centers do and i think that kind of encounters that 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 makes possible is is also something that that supports the business in a wider sense uh, and also for the future thanks a lot for this you i think we should really also uh, kind of uh, think about all those artists that are coming out of art schools and universities this year, next year, uh, who will be a, um, facing a particularly challenging, um, particularly challenging context as well, uh, in terms of, of not being able to show, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult time, but I, I think we we have the resources to to kind of survive the the pandemic professionally. And, and to thrive in the future, um, uh, and, and also kind of continue doing what we are doing uh, in a way which is more um, sustainable and in a way which is conducive to positive social changes, which I, I know uh, uh, all of us, we, we believe in this. I, I'm aware of time. Uh, it's uh, an hour since we started. Um, I thank thank you a lot, um, Johan, uh, for for your for for your for the conversation. Uh, I thank uh, Yaspis and Creative Victoria for the support, uh, and I thank all our participants for for staying with us until the very end. Uh, thanks a lot. We will uh, release the um, the recording in a couple of weeks, uh, and we'll make it uh, accessible uh, in case you want to you want to share it further. And thanks a lot, Eliza, our director of Resartis, for your help and support. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.